Kelsey a hand. Um, with that being said, with that being said, uh, the, we had our inaugural service last month, and, and my brother, Apostle Walter Roberts, boy, if you weren't here, good Lord, he tore this place up, man. I mean, we could, we could hardly get out of here. He, he preached, and, and, uh, and the power, we had hip-hop and all this other stuff going on, and we just had a great time. Can you say amen to that? And so I, I searched my heart, and I asked the Lord, I said, okay, well, who do we bring up for, you know, version 2, 2.0? <laughs> And he laid somebody on my heart who we've known a long time, ever since we've been in Iowa, just about. And she is a teaching evangelist from the city of Muscatine, Iowa. And she is my dear sister in the faith. Why don't you welcome Reverend Robin Ferries as she comes tonight to bless you as the Lord leads you. <laughs> I know, I know. As she said we've already had church and she's ready to go home. Not before she gives the word. Amen? Say amen to that. I am more of a teacher than a preacher. And what God has given me for tonight, oh, man, it, you touched on it during prayer time. And I feel kind of loud here over here, Eric. You touched on it. He, uh, past, past Reverend Morris, is it? Maurice, you touched on it. It's like, Lord God, what are you going to have planned for tonight? I am so up for this. And, Father, I thank you. I thank you that you are the orchestrator, the architect of this evening. Father, I thank you for the souls that you're going to set free tonight. The ones that come into, came in in bondage, that Lord God, you are setting them free tonight. Father, those who walked in in pain are going to be walking out without pain. Father, I praise you and I give you all the glory. And Lord, I just ask that your word comes out concise and clear and just touches not just their, their hearts, but God, their spirits. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, God's word is supernatural in origin. It's eternal in duration. It is inexpressible in valor. It is infinite in scope, regenerative in power. It is infallible in authority. It is universal in application, and it is inspired in its totality. Amen. We should, and we all know this, read it through. We should write it down. We should pray it in. We should work it out, and we should pass it on. We don't keep it for ourselves. We pass it on. But did you also know that this beautiful book, this book, the infallible word of God, is also a book of unbelief. Some of you know that. Some do not. For example, The snake said to Eve in the very beginning, did God really say? Because, you know, you're not surely going to die. Eve wavered, doubted, and ate, and then Adam ate, and sin came into the world. That's the Old Testament. For everything that God did for his children, the Israelites, they wavered. The ten, you know, the ten plagues. Even with the staff that turned into a snake, okay, it, it's, it wasn't a, ten, a plague, but, oh, man, it was still impressive. It's still mind-boggling. But th think about it. The Israelites saw all of this. They saw the water turn into blood. They saw the frogs. They saw the lice, the gnats, the flies, the plague on the livestock, the boils, the hail. They saw the locusts, the darkness, and the death of the firstborn. And terrified, the Egyptians gave the Israelites, gave the Israelites gold, silver, and clothing and yeah. begged them yeah. to leave their country. Yeah. <laughs> As they left, a pillar of cloud led the Israelites to the Red Sea. And when the Egyptian army followed, a pillar of fire protected the Israelites from the army. And then the parting of the Red Sea. Can you imagine the parting of the Red Sea? You've got, I've seen pictures, and I don't know, I wasn't back then, but I've seen pictures of walls of water and big fishes swimming by. Can you imagine? The ground was dry, and they walked through it. Pretty impressive. And over the next few chapters in Exodus, we see that God gave the Israelites water from a rock, manna from heaven, and quail to eat. This ragtag bunch of slaves, untrained for war, then came up against a huge seasoned army, the Amalekites. And while Moses' hands were raised, the Israelites, untrained, unprepared for war, they won the battle. Yeah. Chapter 19 tells us that the Israelites saw the glory of God on Mount Sinai, and they fell felt the mountain shake and that everybody trembled with fear. 
chapters 20, we're still in Exodus, chapters 20 through 23 shows us where God gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments, laws for safety and judgment, and the three festivals that the Israelites were to celebrate. And then in Exodus chapter 24, the Israelites went up to the mountain for the confirmation of the covenant. If you have not read this chapter, you need to read this. Exodus 24, starting in verse 9, Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, which were Aaron's sons, and 70 elders of the Israel, they went up and they saw, they saw the God of Israel. His feet was, under his feet was something like a pavement made of sapphire, clear as the sky itself. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God, 70. They saw God. They ate and they drank. After which Moses went up on the mountain and the Israelites returned to their camp. Anybody want to take a guess how long it took for them to turn away? 47 days. 47 days later, because Moses hadn't returned, the Israelites commanded Aaron to make a golden calf. Without any hesitation or rebuke, Aaron asked for gold to make the calf, and the Israelites bowed down and they sacrificed to it, saying, Here, O Israel, is the God that brought you up out of Egypt. Forty-seven days. After all those miracles, it just took 47 days. Numbers 13, the 12 spies that were sent into Canaan in the promised land to explore, and when they returned, only two out of the 12 believed God and said, Let's go. Number 16, Korah's rebellion, 250 men, community leaders, Greed and pride puffed them up, and the ground opened up, and they, they and all their families went to their graves. First Samuel 17, the unbelief of King Saul and his soldiers when faced with Goliath. For 40 days, Goliath came out to the front of the ranks, and he issued his challenge. And on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. But then a, but then, a young shepherd boy full of faith, stepped up to meet him. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The Old Testament is filled with accounts of unbelief. But you want to know what? So is the New Testament. Matthew 13, when Jesus had finished the parables, he moved up, excuse me, he moved on from there. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't his mother's name Mary, and aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And yes, I'm going to be reading a lot of scripture tonight. Aren't all of his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these, all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, in his own house, is a prophet without honor. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. You know, in chronological order, Jesus, you ready? He changed the water into wine. He cured the nobleman's son. He caused a great haul of fish. He cast out an unclean spirit. He cured Peter's mother-in-law who had a fever. He healed a leper. He healed a centurion's servant. He raised the widow's son from the dead. He cured two demoniacs. Excuse me. He cured the paralytic. He raised the ruler's daughter from the dead. He cured a woman from an issue of blood. He opened the eyes of two blind men. He loosened the tongue of a man who could not speak. He healed an invalid man at the pool called Bethesda. He restored a withered hand. He cured a demon-possessed man. He fed at least 5,000 people, healed a woman of Canaan, cured a deaf and mute man. He fed at least another 4,000 people. He opened the eyes of a blind man, cured a boy who was plagued by demons. <sighs> Opened the eyes of a man born blind, cured a woman who had been afflicted 18 years by a crippling spirit, cured a man of leprosy, yes. cleansed 10 lepers, raised Lazarus from the dead, on, opened the eyes of two blind men, caused the fig tree to wither, restored the ear of the high priest's yes. servant. Yes. He rose from the dead. Yes. And he caused the second great haul of fish. Yes. And John said in the last book, of, the last verse of his book, John, he said, Jesus did many other things. That's right. yeah. That's right. yeah. 
And then if every one of them were written down, he supposed that even the whole world could not have enough room for the books that would be written. But still, all these miracles, everything that they'd seen, Jesus denounced the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not believe. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had been, that had been performed in Tyre and Sodom, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Yeah. 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 So good. So good. And what about his disciples, the ones that walked with him for three years? The 12 who were chosen after a night of prayer by Jesus to be his closest disciples. Let's look at some of them. <laughs> I think you all know where I'm going with this one. <laughs> the healing of Lazarus. Jesus and his disciples had left Judas, or Judea, excuse me, because the Jews were going to stone him, and Lazarus died. And Jesus told his disciples, let us go back to Judea. And after some discussion about this, Thomas called Didymus said, well, we might as well go with him and die. Let's just get it over with. Unbelief. And after Jesus was crucified, it was Thomas. He was not with the other disciples when Jesus first appeared to him appeared to them and he said uh, they told him we have seen the Lord but he said to them unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side I will not believe it a week later his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them and though the doors were locked Jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you and then he said to Thomas put your finger here see my hands reach out your hand and put it into my side stop doubting and believe and that's when, and only when, Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. But you know, Thomas wasn't the only one. Nathaniel didn't believe in Jesus until Jesus told him that he saw him sitting under the fig tree before Philip had found him. And Jesus had to rebuke Peter. He's told him, get behind me, Satan, in Matthew 16, because Jesus was telling his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and die. And Peter was going, oh, no, 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 you're not. And this, you know what? That happened right after Peter declared that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. And after that, Peter said that he would never leave him. Jesus also prophesied that Peter would forsake him three times, deny him three times, and we all know he did. One of the saddest scriptures in the Bible is found in John 6:66. 6, Did you all know that there was at least 66 verses in the book of John, chapter 6? <laughs> Jesus was teaching his disciples, telling him that he was the bread of life and that down to the basics, the only way to heaven is to accept him as the son of God. I'm debating whether to read all of this. I think I'm going to. The way to learn about God and his ways is through Jesus. Jesus is God. And starting in verse 60, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. And he went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. And verse 66. John 6, 66. From this time on. Many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. I, th I think that's the saddest verse in the Bible. Judas Iscariot, who walked away, who had walked with Jesus for three years and then betrayed him because of unbelief. Not realizing who, Jack who Jesus actually was, he betrayed him for 30 silvers, pieces, pieces of silver. See, Judas was expecting a military leader. He wanted somebody strong that was going to be able to kick the Romans out of Jerusalem. And Jesus just wasn't the one that was going to do that. So he betrayed him, not knowing, not believing, no commitment. And see, there 
my friends, is the rub. Not knowing. That is the reason why the prodigal son's older brother became irate. He didn't know what or who he had. He didn't know his own father. And we all know the, we all know the story. In fact, it, I've heard a lot of times over the 24, 25 years that I have been trying to be a disciple of Christ. Sometimes doing a good job, other times eh, not so much. But normally it's from the younger son's point of view. He asks his father for his inheritance, and then, you know, the father gives it to him, and he goes out and he blows it with wild women, drugs, and booze. And he ends up at a farm feeding pigs. And since he's a Jew, feeding pigs, not a good thing. Didn't want to do that. He longed, his stomach longed for the pods that he gave to the pig. So finally he came to his senses, and he thought, well, let's just go back to my dad and say, you know, forgive me. I just want to be a servant in your house. And we all know that... When the father saw him coming from a long way off, the father ran to him, enveloped him in his arms, and just accepted him back. And it's a great story. It really, truly is. But see, I like the older son better. And I'll tell you why. And it starts in verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, the servant replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry, and he refused to go in. So his father went out, and he pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. Okay? So what does God have? Who is he? What are some of his attributes? God is self-existent. He is omnipotent, all-powerful. He is omnipresent. He is omniscient, all-knowing. He is righteous. He is holy. He is eternal. He is good. He is grace. He is indwelling. He is just. He is love. He is mercy. He is sovereign with supreme authority. And he is transcendent. The prodigal son's older brother worked day and night for his father, but never took the time to really get to know his father. Otherwise, he would have known that everything his father had also belonged to him. Sort of sounds like the Israelites, doesn't it? They were afraid to go up onto the mountain because they were afraid that God would kill them because they didn't know him. They only knew about him. Psalms 103.7, he made known his ways. God made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. See, in other words, they knew what God did, but the Israelites didn't know why he did it. And that's why the Israelites trembled with fear and didn't want to go up under the mountain in Exodus 19. But see, we have a better covenant. We have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. When we invited Jesus into our hearts to be our Lord and God, all of his attributes, all of who he is came with him. He's dwelling within our hearts that we may be one as he and the Father are one. And we have the right to partake in him in everything that he is. John 14, starting with verse 8, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Amen. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. Get this? He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. 
But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, and he will remind you of everything I have said to you. So he's going to teach us all things, and he's going to remind us of all the promises that God has given us. All right? What are some of God's promises? Salvation from sin, spirit baptism, protection by angels, soul-winning power, kingdom of heaven, comfort, earth as our inheritance, the filling of righteousness, mercy, a visible God, sonship, blessing for persecution, great rewards, forgiveness of sins, answers to all prayers, answers to prayer according to faith, necessities of life, all good things, physical healing, the second coming of Christ, unlimited power, power to bind and loose, eternal life, divine presence now. And you want to know what? That list that I just read off are just some of the promises only in Matthew. Just in one book. Just some. Are we able to grasp the meaning of this? The God of all the universe is living is living inside of us. Take a minute. Get this in your heart, in your spirit, not just in your heads. Yeah, man, that's the longest mile in the world is between the head and the heart. The God of all the universe is living inside of us. Ephesians 3, Paul states, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled, filled with all the measure, to the measure of all the fullness of God. And it's only this love that stops the unbelief. Friends, the disciple John, I love John. He was the only one of the disciples that leaned his head back and rested his head upon the chest of Jesus the Christ. He was the only one that heard the heartbeat of Jesus and he was the only one that called himself the beloved. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. But let's be real. Let's be honest with ourselves. All of us have setbacks at times and all of us have doubts. Yes. That's right. Okay? That's right. Just don't quit. Yeah. Be honest with yourself and be honest with Jesus. That's all you have to do. Just like the father did in Mark 9. He had a boy, a nine-year-old boy. I think he was a nine-year-old boy that was, had a demon. The demon would throw the boy into the fire and into the water to try and kill him. And the father had taken the boy to the disciples and said, help, help, help. And they couldn't do anything. So he takes him up to Jesus. And he says, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said, if you can, everything is possible for him who believes. And immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. You got problems? You got problems trying to forgive somebody? Then all you got to do is say, Jesus, Lord, I know I need to forgive them. It's hard. Please help me. But, you know, he does. He comes in and he helps you. And one of my prayers is, Lord, I want everybody that I meet to know you and to love you more than I do. And, Lord, I want to know you and love you more than I do now. Help me. Help me. I will never forget Joyce Meyer's testimony when she was preparing for her very first sermon. Not a Bible study, but a sermon. And she was praying, asking God, what should I talk about? And he said, tell my children that I love them. And she said, well, God, everybody knows that you love them. And he said, no. No, they don't. A few years ago, on a Sunday morning, I walked into the building out in Tiffin. And I was early because I wanted to pray for the service and pray for the people coming. And when I walked in, there, there was all of a sudden there was a heaviness in my spirit. And I put my Bible and my purse down and I walked up to the altar and I could hear the Holy Spirit weeping. Mm -hmm. And I said, Holy Spirit, why are you weeping? And he said, because my children do not know me. Mm -hmm. My children do not know me. He weeps because he longs for you to know him. Amen. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, being rooted and established in love, that we may know him. I spoke earlier of the Israelites who didn't know God and who were actually afraid of him, how they made a golden calf 
that they wouldn't be afraid of to take the place of God. I spoke about the New Testament disciples and their battle with faith and unbelief. And in fact, Peter and John really didn't believe until they saw the empty tomb. Romans 10 tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. But you know, it is experience that makes faith becomes truth. And the truth sets you free. I have been walking with Jesus for a while now, and I'm not going to tell anybody how long that's been. Probably, though, not near as long as this wonderful man and woman of God over here. I bow. Awesome. But I have learned three things. The more I know him, the more I love him. The more I know him, the more I want to know him. And the more I know him, the more stupid I realize I really truly am. And I'm going to save the first for last. So number two, the more I know him, the more I want to know him. Years ago, when I was first filled with the Holy Spirit, and I was just so young in the Lord, I sensed this huge, pulsating presence just beyond the tips of my fingers. And have you ever seen a farmer, a picture of a farmer holding a carrot in front of a donkey to make the donkey chase after him? That's how I felt. I was thinking, man, I'm still going to come after you. And I devoured his word. I spent hours in prayer and in worship all by myself. It was as if God put me in a cocoon so that I could grow up in him. But understand this, I don't want to master his word. I want his word to master me. I used to describe myself as a jack of all trades because... You know, you start a hobby or you lose interest real fast. Man, I would lose interest. All I got tired of doing the New York Times crossword puzzle. But see, the more I hear his voice, the more miracles that I see or experience, the more powerful times of worship that I enter into, like tonight, thank you so very much. The more times of beating down of devils, the more I want to do and see and experience of him. He has more and more and more to show me, to give. He is the highest high and the most addicted of drugs. I never get bored with him, and I cannot get enough of him. If I do anything without the Holy Spirit, I get bored. If I try to read the Bible without the Holy Spirit, I get bored. And my attention wanders, and I have to reread the passage that I just read. And when I do that, it's like, okay, Holy Spirit, you've got to help me. If I go to work without involving the Holy Spirit, I get bored. Because God is my all in all, three in one. Without him, I am nothing, but in him, I am everything. Some people at work think that I'm a genius. Because I have answers to a lot of the hardest problems. But you know, it's not me, it's the Holy Spirit within me. I'm not smart, but he sure is. And I pray the scriptures a whole lot. And one of my favorites is Psalms 27. <laughs> I'm going to paraphrase this. I'm going to say it the way I pray it. Papa, one thing I ask of you, this is what I seek. That I may dwell in your house on the days of my life to gaze upon your beauty. Papa, your heart says to me to seek your face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. The more I know him, the more stupid I realize I really truly am. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but the life I live in this body, I live by his faith. The one that died, that loved me and died for me. <laughs> Isaiah 55. My thoughts, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Romans 3, 4, let God be true and every man a liar. Amen. Before I was saved, even though I was sort of kind of raised in a Methodist Presbyterian church, I didn't have an experience with Jesus. I picked and chose what I wanted to believe, sort of believed in Jesus, sort of believed in reincarnation. I had no commitment even to myself. I went wherever the world yes. led me. And there's a friend that I have up in Cedar Rapids. He's retired. He's wealthy. Um, a very humble gentleman. Very powerful in the Lord. And he told me in one of our many conversations, he told me one time that he regretted the things that he had done before he got saved. 
and I thought about this because this man I really truly honor and admire and I thought about what he, what he said. And I came to the conclusion that yeah, I, I do regret the things that I did, but see that's covered on, by the blood. Yeah. It's gone, it's wiped out. You know what I want, what I really truly regret? That I lived 32 years of my life on this planet without knowing him. I wasted that time. In Luke 7, the sinful woman who anointed Jesus' feet with an alabaster jar of perfume. First she wept on his feet, then dried his feet with a hair, and then poured perfume from an alabaster jar onto his feet. It's not that the woman had more sin in her life, that she had more sin than any other, any other person. It's not that I have more sin than anybody else. But it's the fact that she recognized to a greater depth the amount of her sin. She recognized her sin for what it was, and she recognized the grace, the love, the forgiveness, the unmerited favor of Jesus the Christ. And she believed and committed herself to his service by anointing his feet. She knew that she had been forgiven, and she allowed herself to be forgiven. Did you hear that? She allowed herself to be forgiven. Those who have been forgiven much, love much. Power doesn't come from who you are in him. It comes from who he is and who you recognize him to be in you. Jesus did very little miracles in his own hometown because they didn't know him for who he truly is. Friends, this walk isn't about me. It isn't about you. It's about him and recognizing him for who he truly is. He is God. One of the definitions of commitment is this. It is a state of being obligated or emotionally impelled. Peter's level of commitment belief grew from denying Jesus three times to being crucified on a cross upside down. He felt unworthy to be put to death in the same way as his master. <coughs> so he requested to be crucified with his head down. Andrew was crucified. John exiled to the island of Patmos because he didn't die when he was boiled in oil. You know, they say you, this happened in Rome, and they say that uh, since he wasn't hurt by the oil, that everybody that was in that Colosseum and saw this became a Christian. Amen. James, the son of Zebedee, put to death by Herod Agrippa shortly before the day of Passover. Matthew died as a martyr in Ethiopia. Thomas died as a martyr, speared with a lance, in Edessa. James, son of Alphaeus, was thrown down from the temple by the scribes and the Pharisees and stoned, and his brains were dashed out with a club. John the Baptist was beheaded in prison. So much for unbelief, it kind of went away. Amen. Why? Because they had an experience with Jesus. Amen. What is the level of your commitment? I'm not saying that you will be martyred, although, really, in today's possibility, in today's world, is a possibility. But the level of your commitment to Christ is di directly related to your belief in him, yes. which is directly related to your level of an intimate relationship that you have with Jesus. Yes. It is a commitment bound in love. Yes. How is your devotional life? Yes. Do you know him? Do you know the love that he has for you? How much time do you spend meditating on his word in prayer, in worship? I don't mean in a church, mm -hmm. right. but in your own home, in your own right. prayer closet. <clears throat> Do you know his voice? Have you been baptized with his spirit? Are you walking in the power with the signs being demonstrated that are listed in Mark? And I'm not trying to condemn come on, come on. Come anyone. On. I'm trying to make you hungry for his love. Amen. Years ago, it was on a weekday. I took the kids to school and I went to the church. This was up in Cedar Rapids, back in the days of CD players. <laughs> yes, I'm old. <laughs> but, yes, yeah, so did I. But I was in the sanctuary and I was praying and, and worshiping and reading his word and I was in there for a couple hours. And I'm not saying that to boast. I was in there because I just, I'm totally, completely hopelessly in love with Jesus, and his presence was awesome. 
And I thought, it, you know, like I said, I'd been there a couple hours, and I thought I was finished. I felt in my spirit, okay, I need to leave now and go start my day. I've got some errands I've got to get done. And I reached to turn off the CD player, and I heard his voice. And he said, no, don't leave me. Not yet. Stay a little longer. And there was such yearning and longing in that voice that it broke my heart. And all I could do was weep. He loves us so much. He wants us in his presence. Can we minister? A few years ago, back in 2008, the Lakeland revival had started with Todd Bentley. And I went to a friend's house to watch it on God TV. And it was like, oh, man, I really, really want to go, but I don't have the money, and I don't have the vacation hours saved up to go. I was a single mother. But God put it on my heart. That was a Friday night that I watched on God TV. I couldn't sleep Friday night, couldn't sleep Saturday night, couldn't sleep Sunday night. Monday morning, I went in and I talked to my group leader, and I said, I know I don't have the vacation hours, but can I have a week off? And he said, yeah, sure, no problem. <laughs> really? I was in a position where it was kind of hard to fill, to backfill. And I go, really? Okay. And I was thinking, Lord, God, I don't have any money. Besides that, I don't have enough vacation hours to fill, so next week when I'm gone, I'm not going to have any money coming in. So, Lord, if I'm going to go, you're going to have to do something. Yeah. People started coming out of the woodwork, handing me money. People, the, I was talking with one, guy, one gentleman after a prayer meeting, and all of a sudden he got this really, it was almost funny, look on his face, and he reached in his pocket, and he gave me all the money that was in his pocket. I had a woman call me up and said, by the way, God told us to pay for a hotel room for you and your daughter. So we went down. We left on a Friday night right after work and got down there just in time for the Saturday night service. And it was awesome. And the next morning I woke up, I woke up with a, a really bad headache. Because I think it was because of all the traveling. So we, we went out to eat and lo and behold, Todd Bentley was there. <laughs> and I so wanted to go up to him, but I, I, mean, I wasn't going to interrupt the gentleman in his breakfast. wasn't going to do that. But it just so happened that we walked out at the same time. We paid for our bills and walked out at the same time, so I stopped him. And I said, sir, excuse me for bothering you, but I have a migraine. Would you please pray? And he did. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely nothing. And I walked out of there with a headache going, really, God, what's going on here? Why in the world did you want me to come down here? Because I'm expecting power to flow from this guy, and there was nothing coming. It was Mother's Day that Sunday. That night we went to the service, and they called all the mothers up. We were in the arena at this time. They called all the mothers up for prayer. You're talking hundreds of women. It was a cattle call. Lines and lines. They had, the, they had all the women lined up, and I don't know how many lines of women there was all the way across the arena. And Todd was just going down and touching people's foreheads, and some women were falling, other women were not. And when that line was done, the other line would step up. Prayer group had given me a package of brand new handkerchiefs to have to see if I could get Todd to pray over them. So I thought, aha, here's my chance. So I went down there, and I stood in line. I was down at the end. I watched him come, and I was holding on to those handkerchiefs. He came down. He wasn't really praying, stopping from praying for everybody, for, for actually for anybody. He was just tapping them on the heads. He came to me, and he saw the handkerchiefs, and he put his hand on it. He stopped, and he prayed over them, touched me on the forehead, and went on. And I'm thinking, God, where are you? God's presence was really strong in that arena. The worship was wonderful. People were getting healed, and, and it, it was awesome. And I'm not going to go into what was going on at the time because, one, if you don't know, it's none of your business, and, two, if you do know, keep praying for them. That's all I want to say. One, one of the nights that I was there, a woman came up to me and said, God told me that I need to ask you to pray for me, and he's going to heal me. So I stepped back, and I looked at her, and I told you, I'm, I'm feeling God's presence in the arena. But I stepped back and I looked at her and I said, 
reach behind you, reach behind your neck, grab that snake, pull him off, and throw him away. She did. The moment she did that, she started jumping up and down, pain-free in, in the first time in two years. Amen. God is good. But am I saying all this because there's coming to a part here that God wanted me to do? Bob Jones was coming. I didn't know that he was going to be there when I was there, but I'd heard after I got there, and I'm thinking, oh, great, Bob Jones. And so I got up on the second level, and I got even with the, with the platform so I could see Bob Jones, you know? I don't know if any of you recognize his name. He's gone on to be with the Lord, but man, he was a prophet in the most high caliber. It was so awesome just to sit and listen to this gentleman. And that night, worship was awesome. And after worship, Todd Bentley called all the European uh, pastors up for prayer. He was going to pray the Ezekiel prayer over them to fill their mouths. And I'm thinking, no, 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 no. Get Bob Jones up there. Forget the pastors. You know, just get Bob Jones up. I want to listen to him. And he's called them all forward, and he started praying for them. I'm going, okay, fine. And then I heard his voice. And he said, tilt your head back. Open your mouth, and I will feel it. So I did. After a couple of minutes, I looked at my daughter and I said, you're going to have to help me down these steps because I was doubled over. I couldn't stand up straight and I was afraid I was going to fall. She helped me down the steps and I got down to the little walkway, doubled over. She helped me out to the causeway and it was as far as I could make it. I was on the ground, on the concrete, sobbing. With wave after wave after wave of glory. About an hour later, it stopped and I got up and there was... <laughs> a pool of tears and snot on the concrete floor. <laughs> Went into the bathroom, cleaned up as best as I could, and came out, and you can start playing that music. Came out and whopped up the floor and went to sit with my daughter, and I realized Bob Jones had come and gone, and I didn't care. I didn't care. But see, I'm telling you this story because God told me to. He says in his word, and he told me when he, t when he reminded me of the story, he said, Freely you receive, freely give. <laughs>